My name is James Pelletier. I've just started as a postdoc in the group of Saul Ares at the National Biotechnology Center in Madrid. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity to share our work on cell division in Synth3A with this expert group. And I'd very much appreciate your feedback. So as an outline, after a slide on motivation, we'll describe our previous work on genes required for cell division in JCVI Synth3A. And among those genes, some of those genes required for normal cell division do not have a known biomolecular function. And that leads to more recent work on bioinformatic analyses of proteins required for cell division, as well as a physical description of cellular mechanics, rather than jump from genes to the process of cell division, one can ask what physical states are compatible with cell division and then what is the genetic basis for key physical parameters underlying those states, in particular, the surface area to volume ratio and membrane curvature. So as motivation, the left uh, side of this slide is a representation of the proteome of JCVI Syn3A based on measurements from the lab of David Gonzalez at UCSD. Each sector is proportional to the abundance of the protein and the proteins are classified by essentiality and colored by known function. And then on the right is an illustration of a JCVI Syn3A cell by David Goodsell. I'm very much looking forward to your talk on Monday. And a major question is how to relate the protein composition to the complex structure and function of the cell. How did these proteins self-organize into a functional cell? And as minimal cells, have a reduced genome with less redundancy, one hopes that that connection is clearer. But in this talk, as well as in other processes, of course, the connection between genotype and phenotype remains complicated. So this cell presents an exciting model system to study these questions. So um, I'll now present a work on behalf of this collaboration between a team at the JCVI led by John Glass, Elizabeth Strakowski at NIST, and teams at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms in UC San Diego. And for these two scanning electron micrographs of SYN 1.0 and SYN 3.0 are shown at the same scale. So SYN 1.0 exhibits significantly less morphological variation. The cells are about the same size and shape, all several hundred nanometers in diameter. Whereas SYN 3.0 exhibits more morphological variation. Some cells are greater than several microns in diameter. They still constrict, but that constriction is less controlled. It's less, it's, there's, there's more variation. So uh, a question motivating this work is what genes are required for normal morphology? An assumption underlying this project was that we had lost genes that contribute to control of cell division in SYN 1.0, although it's also possible to imagine that addition of a gene could perturb normal cell division. But here we were looking to identify which genes were lost that if added back to SYN 3.0 would restore normal cell division. So here, the team took advantage of the segmented structure of the genome. It's possible to study the effect of one minimized segment from SYN 3.0 in the context of an otherwise wild type genome of SYN 1.0. And fortunately, in a sense, only the minimized segment six in the context of an otherwise wild type genome conferred extreme morphological variation. So this strain allows one to re uh, restrict the search from the 428 genes that are missing in SYN 3.0 to the 76 genes that are missing in this strain with the minimized segment six. And also guided the search for strains that have additional genes that were missing in that segment six which led to the identification of JCVI Syn3A by a team at the JCVI. So this strain retains 19 more genes than JCVI Syn3.0, and it exhibits significantly less morphological variation than this strain lacking the with the minimized segment six as well as Syn3.0. This is a list of the genes that are retained in JCVI Syn3A. And looking at what's currently known about the function of these genes, one cluster of contiguous genes jumped out. It includes this protein, FTSZ, which is highly conserved. It's a tubulin homologue. 
and it forms protofilaments that often localize at the division site in bacteria. And it can generate a force that can constrict liposomes. And it also acts as a scaffold that organizes the division site in bacteria. So when we saw this, we thought, oh, perhaps if we add back this cluster of genes that includes FTSC, that could restore normal cell division in JCVI sin 3.0. But um, that did not happen. Adding back the FTSC containing cluster, there was still extreme morphological variation. So this uh, project, this, this aspect led by co-first author Li Ji Sun, Li Ji undertook a systematic search to find the smallest subset of genes from SYN3A that can restore normal cell division. And Li Ji used a variety of approaches and identified this set of seven, which are sufficient to restore normal cell division in the genomic context of JCVI SYN 3.0. Among these seven, five of the genes currently do not have a known biomolecular function, though in combination with FDSC, um, they can restore normal cell division. So this leads to ongoing work and, and recent work on what might those genes be doing? How do they contribute to normal cell division? So this project was led by David Bianchi in the lab of Zanluk B. Shulton, and I'm thankful for the chance to have been discussing with them um, uh, on, their, on their work on bioinformatic analysis of these genes. And um, David applied a range of approaches, including structure prediction using AlphaFold2, as well as other bioinformatic analyses so I'll now show the predicted structures of these seven genes, as well as um, current hypotheses about how those genes, what those genes might be doing. This is, these are the predicted structures of FDSZ, as well as a gene CEPF, which um, can anchor FDSZ to the membrane. Gene 520 uh, is annotated now as a YQKD uh, um, uh, based on homology to a gene from Bacillus subtilis. And it may have lipase or esterase activity. So um, to echo Isaac's point, um, perhaps membrane remodeling um, by this gene or other genes could um, contribute to cell division and cell morphology in the cell. Gene 527 is annotated as a homologue of YLBN, which there's actually very little um, uh, literature on this family of proteins. Um, there's a 2016 paper that it could be involved in accumulation of 23S ribosomal RNA, but how that relates to cell divisions is unclear. And these remaining three genes, which um, are predicted to associate with a membrane, there's still, even after the structural prediction, there's still very little um, uh, hypotheses for uh, how these genes might be contributing to cell division. So. Um, I find it exciting now to study the effects of these genes uh, uh, by different approaches. And something else coming out of this work is that David identified other genes present in the SYN 3.0 genome. So they're present in both 3.0 and 3A, which are also associated with cell division in other species. This includes EZRA, which um, can modulate the assembly of FDSC protofilaments, as well as GPSB, which interacts with a number of members of the division uh, machinery. And there's a GPSB homolog called DIV IVA, DIV IVA, that can interact with cardiolipins. So it's possible to now generate hypotheses for how the lipid components of uh, the membrane might interact with division machinery. Um, there's a still a number of genes that um, uh, contribute to cell division and still there's a number of genes with not, without a known function that contribute to cell division. So the, the mechanisms, the, the physical mechanisms remain unclear. So we're currently considering uh, physical descriptions of cellular mechanics to generate hypotheses for, to guide future experiments. So this is a collaboration with, with John Glass and Elizabeth Strakowski at NIST. So uh, for starters, how might one conceptualize the physical properties of the cell? So this is a, uh, uh, taking pictures of the cell every 500 milliseconds. And we observed that the cells, the shape of the cells uh, fluctuates over that time scale. So the cells do not have a peptidoglycan 
cell wall and their shape fluctuations are qualitatively consistent with having a fluid membrane, we haven't done any kind of quantitative measurement, um, but would be excited to, to do so. Um, but at least qualitatively, the description of vesicles or liposomes might be um, applicable. So now this slide is adapted from uh, previous work uh, on simple models for uh, uh, vesicles with a, with a fluid membrane based on work by Lepowski, um, Seifert, and Svetina. So this uh, diagram on the left is a phase diagram which predicts a shape of a vesicle that minimizes the bending energy of the membrane. The horizontal axis is a metric for the surface area to volume ratio. One on the right corresponds to a fully inflated cell, and zero on the far left corresponds to a fully deflated cell. And then the vertical axis is a metric for the, the preferred curvature of the membrane. What curvature corresponds to zero bending energy, where positive represents more curved? So these different shapes uh, are the shapes that minimize the bending energy. So this would be in the absence of any FDSZ ring. The assumption here is a membrane with uniform properties. So the point here is that these shapes, um, these models for vesicles predict or can predict fully constricted shapes at certain points in the phase diagram, which just result from a minimization of bending energy of a membrane with uniform properties. So we think it's important to keep this in mind to think about in what physical context might FDSZ or a Z ring or other pro specific proteins that modulate the process of cell division, what, in what context are they operating? And Bozik and Svetina um, have, have um, generated models that describe cyclical shape transformations that resemble cell division cycles. Um, and now in the last slide, I'll describe um, a review. This is no new experimental work, but a review of current knowledge of genes that underlie these key physical parameters, the horizontal axis surface area to volume ratio and the vertical axis membrane curvature. So to hypothesize genes that contribute to cell division, um, there are a number of transporters in, that are retained in SYN3A, including 14 unassigned transporters. And um, the small uh, molecule composition of the cytoplasm likely uh, underlies osmo, the osmotic pressure gradient across the membrane, which in turn underlies the, the volume of the cell. So the subunit of the potassium transporter, which was shown to be important for osmoregulation in other species, is retained in SYN3A. But this seems like an exciting area for future research on how does the um, uh, biosynthesis in SYN3A couple to the small molecule fraction of the cytoplasm, which in turn couples to regulation of the volume of the cell. And then um, echoing Isaac's talk, um, how does incorporation of lipid species as well as synthesis of membrane proteins underlie the uh, growth of the surface area of the cell? And furthermore, um, there are certain proteins that can catalyze the, uh, the flip-flop of lipids either from the outer leaflet to the inner leaflet or vice versa, which can be important for membrane curvature. And now, um, considering proteins that may be involved in membrane curvature, SYN3A retains a number of cytoskeletal proteins, FDSC as well as CEPF and FDSA, which can anchor FDSC to the membrane, as well as EZRA, which can modulate the assembly of FDSC protofilaments. And then, um, depending on the, on, the, on the growth media, can include cardiolipin in the membrane, um, retains cardiolipin synthase, and I noted this GPSB protein, which in in vitro studies has been shown to interact with cardiolipin rich domains. And in other work, cardiolipin can localize or sort to more highly curved regions of membranes. So one can imagine feedbacks between membrane curvature, sorting of lipids, um, binding of proteins and generation of curvature. So this could be very complicated. Um, there are a number of lipoproteins that are retained and crowding of lipoproteins in the outer leaflet in vesicles has been shown to generate membrane curvature. So this could potentially contribute to membrane curvature. And then to the extent that the chromosome couples with the membrane, the bending energy or deformation, the energy to deform the chromosome could be comparable to the energy to deform the membrane. Um, although I don't know, but it could be. So the mechanics of the chromosome could be important for the, for the shapes and mechanics of the membrane potentially. And a recent conversation uh, SYN3A retains uh, ATP synthase, 
which can generate membrane curvature. And I, I'm saying this because there might be a number of other uh, mechanisms that can generate membrane curvature or are relevant to surface area to volume ratio. But this is a summary based on, on my current knowledge of, of the genes. So in summary, um, a physical description of mechanics could provide an interlayer between genotype and phenotype. Rather than jumping from genes such as FTSC to the process of cell division, um, we hope that uh, applying physical models could help guide future experiments looking at what kind of forces might be acting, how does the cell regulate its surface area to volume ratio, what mechanisms could generate curvature, and then which genes underlie each of those sub-properties of the cell. So with that, we'd like to thank everybody who contributed to this work, um, as well as um, others for helpful feedback and critical critical feedback. So thank, thank you very much all. Beautiful piece of work, James. Thanks, John. I, it just occurred to me, thinking about your talk and Isaac's talk, is there a way to measure if there was a difference between the lipid composition of the inner leaf of the membrane and the outer leaf of the membrane? I believe there are ways to do that, but I, technically I don't know how that's done. But I think that is possible. And um, Isaac, if, if you if you know, please um, please please. Uh, well, please James, jump. yeah, or James, James, yeah. James. I'll I'll jump in. Um, I do know there are ways. I actually was at a conference from Monday to yesterday, where people did exactly that, just with a different organism. So I actually I had a quick question for this talk, but I think it might be better to hold that and then schedule a time for either the two of us or John, if you want to join in. I would love to have to. a longer conversation because there's a lot here that I'm really interested in. And also for things like studying membrane asymmetry, I think I might be able to be really helpful. So let's connect at a later point offline, but super That'd great talk wonderful. and really exciting. Thanks, Isaac. And I'll send you a note to follow up. Thank you very much. Just, just thinking about, you know, still only three talks in, but what I'm really seeing already this year as opposed to last year is we are really moving to a greater level of understanding as opposed to facts about the system. This is really giving us maybe a, a better chance to understand how life works. And I think this is just fabulous.